Okay, I think it's time to get started here. There's still maybe some people wandering in, but uh, I think we can get started. My name is Wayne Bossinger. I'm co-president of the Squirrel Gum Historic Society. Glad to see everybody come in here tonight. You know, we have some stiff competition here with the, the Democratic uh, debates. But anyway, I'm glad everyone can make it. Um, you know, we're a volunteer organization, and uh, can't emphasize how important these volunteers are to make this all work. So I'd like to introduce the ones that are here today. Uh, we have our co-president, Helen Wilson. Vice yeah. president. Co-vice president. Co-vice president, <laughs> sorry. Co-vice president, Helen Wilson. Uh, our other co-vice president, Betty Conley. Um, and then we have our the board member and camera person, uh, Audrey Glickman, back there. And there is... Tony Indovino, who is now our email coordinator. Um, this uh, month marks the beginning of the 2020 membership drive, and anyone who's a new member that applies now will receive membership for not only 2020, but also for the two remaining months of 2019. Um, Applications can be found on the back table back there. Um, uh, we also have several books for sale in the back there. This includes two of them on History of Squirrel Hill, published by the Squirrel Hill Historic Society. Um, I think that's it. And we have a new book there published by one of our board members here, Andre Clickman. And Helen, would you like to? Oh no, I just going to talk about it. Okay. Exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you to my fellow board members for letting me put it back there. There's a smidgen of history in it. The, the book is called Pockets. The problem with society is in women's clothing. <laughs> And in fact, the lack of pockets, and I prove it, I think, pretty well with a lighthearted view, but it's a serious problem. We just don't have pockets. You, you can peruse it. It's graciously, they've let me put it on the back table. Thank you. My boss in 1978 had a purse. He, he loved having a purse. <laughs> okay, I'd also like to announce the concert coming up uh, on Saturday, October 6th, or 26th at Campbell Memorial Chapel at Chatham University. It's called Music for Food. And, and it's remembering a tree of life uh, uh, event. And it's a number of uh, violin, cello, and piano um, concerts. So uh, there's some flyers in the back table back there if you're interested. I'm the pianist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, another thing in the back table there, I'm gonna, we're going to put it back there in a minute. Um, Ralph Lund, one of our longtime board members, uh, just had to resign recently, and we put together a card, which anyone that knows him can sign, sign the card and give him their best, best wishes. Uh, that'll be in the back table back there. Um, Wayne, could I just say that the reason the card has the Squirrel Hill News on it is because he was instrumental in getting that online. I mean, he has done quite a lot of things for the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, so um, the card sort of looks that, that way. So please, if you knew him, sign it. Okay, and getting into the upcoming events, uh, our next month's meetings titled uh, The New Pittsburgh City Archives, Highlights of the Collection, and present, be presented by the city's chief archive, Nick Hartley, and he previously worked as an archivist with the Heinz History Center. Um, he is a founding steering committee member of Three Rivers Archivist, received a master's degree in library and information science from Pitt, 
And he has a number of other uh, accomplishments here. Um, but he'll pre be presenting that the second Tuesday of next month. Um, December's meeting will be presented by our own Dr. Barbara Burston. It's entitled The Irrepressible Sophie Masoff. Um, Sophie's a member of the Squirrel Hill Historic Society and teaches at both the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. Barbara is a member. Anyway, yeah, and she's a noted expert in the American Jewish experience and has written several books, including Jewish Pittsburgh, Steel City Jews, Steel City Jews and Prosperity, Depression and War, and Sophie Massoff, the mayor from Squirrel Hill, which is the subject of this talk. Um, that brings up up to today's speaker. Um, oh, Wayne, excuse me, before you, you go on, I just wanted to add, I'm sorry for interrupting, but about the membership, you know, the meetings are free. And we're a nonprofit organization, and we depend on, on mem membership dues for the day-to-day -day operations of the place, such as rental and insurance and things like that. And what we do offer members is a monthly eight-page newsletter with our Wayne's research, my research, other people's research, and all of you who are welcome to submit articles. Um, so anyway, if you want to take a look at what the newsletter looks like, we have samples back here. You can check it out after the talk. But I just wanted to add that because this is, <laughs> this is our lifeblood. <laughs> so, okay. okay, thank you, Helen. Um, anyway, today's presentation is titled Prohibition Pittsburgh, presented by author of the book, Richard Kazarek. Uh, Richard was a journalist for four decades, author of four books, um, Black Valley, Life and Death of Fanny Sellins, Prohibition Pittsburgh, Wicked Pittsburgh, and the mayor of Shantytown, the life of Father James Renshaw Cox. He's currently working on new books on jazz and McCarthyism. So, without further ado here, I'd like to turn this over. Thank you all for coming tonight. There must be nothing going on at Squirrel Hill. <laughs> I draw such a great crowd. I was telling some of the people that I spoke to, as many as 85 people, and I spoke to zero people. And I'm wondering, how do you speak to zero people? I says, I talk to the bartenders at this bar, and they, was, they were very interesting. Uh, let me just begin by saying that I never had an intention to write this book. I knew nothing about prohibition. Actually, I had submitted a proposal to a publisher for some uh, for another book, and they said, it stinks, we don't want to do it. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, they called me and said, we're interested in a book on prohibition in Pittsburgh. Would you do it? And I said, I have no clue about prohibition in Pittsburgh. I have no clue. It's not, some, not something that's ever been on my radar, so to speak. And I said, give me a few days. Let me do a little research, and I'll get back to you. Well... I was excited when I did the research because Pittsburgh was a horrendously violent town. Uh, in a four-year period, there were 200 unsolved murders and 100 unsolved bombings in this city, all related to liquor. And my only other experience is I can remember when I was either in high school or college and I was reading them local hometown paper, and they had one of these columns where they talk about events that happened days in the past, and I saw my grandfather. It said, Andrew Gazerix, the front of his house blew off when a furnace exploded. And I took the paper and I said to my dad, I said, hey, Pop, what grandpa, what was he doing? Bad furnace, he started laughing. He says the old man was at a still, and he didn't watch it, and it got to blow off in front of his house. So that's my only experience with with, um, with prohibition. But what I would like to do is begin by uh, asking you to answer a question. Who wants to tell me when prohibition started? 21. Started in World War One, yeah. before the Volstead Act was passed. 
there was a thing called the Lever Food Control Act. And what it did is it limited the amount of grains and wheat and corn and stuff like that, rye, that you could use to make liquor or beer because they wanted to save it for the war effort in Europe. So uh, you could get beer during World War I, but it was 2.75% alcohol, and then it was further reduced to 0.5%. And um, so has anybody ever heard of a product called Bevo? Bevo was uh, like the start of bootlegging. This is like during the war. We don't have prohibition officially yet. So Bevo was a cereal-based drink that looked like beer, had a foamy head, and it tasted like beer, but it had no booze in it. So these guys would take, buy this by the case and the crate and the barrel, and they would juice it with alcohol. And that's how they got around some of these World War I restrictions. So when World War I ends, everybody's saying, hallelujah, we're going to be able to drink regularly. But something happened. The Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League got control of both houses of Congress. And they pushed for prohibition. So um, the drives, one of the day, we had it. It was uh, took effect. It was actually enacted in 1919, but it took effect on January 16, 1920. It was the 18th Amendment. And I mentioned the Women's Christian Temperance Union is involved in this because at the end, we're going to talk about women again in relationship to prohibition. Pittsburgh literally was ringing wet with illegal alcohol during those days. It was wet enough for rubber boots, one historian wrote, and it said downtown Pittsburgh was known as the Great Wet Way. <laughs> you couldn't go anywhere without it finding illegal liquor for sale. In a, one period, from December 21st to not September 1920, excuse me, December 20, 1921 to September 1924, revenue agencies 7,000 gallons of alcohol, 5,000 quarts of whiskey, 300 gallons of moonshine, 1,200 gallons of wine, 105 quarts of bitter, 75 quarts of gin, 600 gallons of Jamaican ginger, destroyed 70, 65 steels, seized 37,000 gallons of mash, and 5,900 pounds of corn sugar. Sounds like a lot, right? Mm -hmm. In that, in this four-month period, bootleggers produced 100,000 gallons of moonshine a week, 1,500 gallons of whiskey, 6,000 gallons of Canadian whiskey were smuggled into Pittsburgh. It, it was coming in to the point where they were bringing these tank cars and you you still needed alcohol for industrial purposes, but people tried to hijack these cars. Passenger trains, when they would pull into Pittsburgh, robbers would come in and shake down the passengers for alcohol. Not their money, they wanted to find their alcohol if they were carrying any booze from out of town. Now, you know, we've all heard of this thing called the Volstead Act. It was named after Andrew Volstead, who was a, a congressman. He was just a name. The real power behind that was a congressman from Texas by the name of Morris Shepard. He's actually the man who authorized the 18th Amendment, and he's considered the father of prohibition. Although everybody, look, what the hell am I doing? Oh, he is considered the father of prohibition, not not uh, Volstead. Uh, Shepard also was such a Teetotaler, but he was also the author behind something called the Webb Canyon Act, which regulated the shipment of interstate shipment of alcohol. And uh, what else did he do? Oh, he's uh, <laughs> the Bone Dry Act is also something that he helped <laughs> pass in 1916, which means you could not have liquor in D.C. District of Columbia. It's ironic because Herbert Hoover, when he was Commerce Secretary, he liked to go to a foreign embassy every Friday afternoon for happy hour because the foreign embassies were considered foreign soil, but not part of the United States. Um, now, one of our homeboys who was, was charged with enforcing prohibition, Andrew Mellon, not too far, over in East Liberty. Now, he was not particularly trusted by the Drys, and he had, they had good reason. First of all, he owned 
the Old Overholt Distillery in Scottsdale. Anybody ever been there? Mm -hmm. been there? Have you tasted their new? I haven't tasted it yet. Well, they, oh, they made Old Overholt. That's Henry Clay Frick's home. And uh, unfortunately, I have tasted Old Overholt <laughs> from the 30s and 20s. Uh, I had a friend uh, who retired at a very old age, and I worked for Dick Scaife, Dick Richard Mellon Scaife, and he gave this guy a bottle of bonded in, I think, 23. And after he retired, he says, come on over, we're going to taste this stuff. I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't, it's only good for, like, getting your paintbrushes clean. <laughs> I hope the stuff that the Japanese are now making is better. Um, well, so they didn't trust him for a couple good reasons. In addition to owning old Overholt, there was a building in Pittsburgh that Andrew Mellon owned, and it got raided by the feds one day, and they found 100 cases of beer, 25 pints of whiskey, three cases of malt, and 20 cases of gin. Now, he, he wasn't involved in it directly, but it was his building. It was enough to cast a shadow over his, you know, his integrity. And then he also, liked when he went to New York on business, he liked to stay at the Ritz-Carlton. And uh, the feds raided that, and they found a, a still in the basement of that hotel <laughs> when he was happened to be staying there on business. <clears throat> and then the third reason why, he had a son-in-law, David Bruce, who was a very famous uh, Wall Street lawyer. And the National Green Yeast Company tried to get a permit to sell yeast, and it was rejected. So the company hired Mellon's son-in-law, and guess what? This guy gets transferred to Nowheresville, and they get the permit. So he was not, and he liked the drink. I mean, he liked the cocktail once in a while. There was a muckraking journalist by the name of Walter Liggett who came to Pittsburgh. He, he wrote a series of articles about the effects that prohibition brought to various cities. And he, Titled uh, the, the, sub, the headline of his story about Pittsburgh was the Metropolis of Corruption, and um, he wrote that prohibition gave us the mafia, the police corruption, political corruptions, murder, bombings, an increase in alcoholism, and then I told you about the murders and unsolved bombings. And just a minute, I'm going to grab grab one of these books. to a square block in Pittsburgh with a perfectly brazen political alliance between big business on one hand and blind piggers on the other, which has no parallel in the United States today. Police served as a collection agency for politicians while Republican Ward Chairman sold the rights to operate speakeasies, gambling parlors, and houses of prostitution to the highest bidders. That's our town. Yes. <laughs> Very true. And uh, probably the worst, and I, I say this unequivocally, the worst mayor in the history of Pittsburgh had to be Mayor Charles Klein. During his 51 months in office, there were, he had uh, over 100 murders, all unsolved. And he organized, actually organized corruption. He divided the city into districts. And he pointed a person in each district. What that person was, he would uh, see to the distribu distribution of uh, liquor, how much you should buy, what the price was going to be, and how much payoff you had to make. And Klein even instructed police officers, and, and when I say officers, I'm talking about ranking officials, I'm not talking about patrolmen, and the, the like, inspectors and chief of detectives. They were only limited to taking $30,000 a year in bribes. This is in the early 1920s. Now you figure you're making $2,800 a year as a salary, and these guys were, 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 were you know, taking all this kind of uh, back um, payoff. Um, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette had organized campaigns, anti vice crusades, all the time against Steve Speakeasy's He's Ray Spriegel. It seems like every 10 years. He, he wrote a series of stories about vice and corruption. He was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, fearless, totally fearless. And he uh, once ran a spread of all those different speakeasies. And he would put a, like a white arrow saying, okay, you get in here, 
and it's run by this guy. You put the names up, and these are the police inspectors who protect it. Now you think that's pretty, pretty shameful, right? These gangsters must have had their shame glands surgically removed because it had no effect on them whatsoever. The, the flow of liquor continued. The other problem was the revenue agents, the federal revenue agents, didn't get along with Pittsburgh police. Uh, Pittsburgh police often rode shotgun on liquor trucks at night, or they guarded stills. Once there was a raid by the feds, and they broke into this big warehouse, and they found the Pittsburgh police guarding it. It almost ended up into a gunfight. I mean, they've arrested cops in the suburban areas, uh, caught them unloading liquor trucks for various uh, uh, bootleggers. It got so bad, Hill District was a very, very big spot. And um, there was a police magistrate who was a strong political power. His name was John Verona. He was a former revenue agent. He was a former bootlegger. And now he was a police magistrate. And once <laughs> the Pittsburgh police raided a bunch of speakeasies in his district that he was being paid to protect, and he got really angry, so he sent an army of his constables down to the police station in the Hill District to arrest the lieutenant that ran the raid. And this lieutenant ended up locking himself in the jail so the constables couldn't get to him. And that's how that's how there's that's how much money was out there. That's what was at stake. It, it was money. And in 1928, a federal grand jury indicted 167 people. There were members of Mayor Klein's administration. Police magistrates, police inspectors, lieutenants, patrolmen, two state legislatures, and five Republican war chairmen. And uh, guess what? None of them were convicted. It was very difficult to, to really bring a case in those days. There was an undercover agent. His name was Saul Grill. He was brought in from out of town, and he posed as a bootlegger, and he was accepting bribes from these people. And despite all the evidence he accumulated, nobody got arrested. Now, one of the things that I found in my research which surprised me was that, um, what do you think the key, if you're, if you're watching the old Untouchables with Elliot Ness, what do you think the key was, uh, the fighting was over, what do you think, was it market share, was it sales? Territory? No. <coughs> Yeast, <laughs> sugar, those were the keys to um, bootlegging. Whoever controlled the, um, the quantity and the price of yeast could, be, could make a fortune. And I, I kind of chuckled when I saw these uh, Pittsburgh newspapers, they always talked about <coughs> yeast kings or yeast barons. And the only thing these people had in common was a short lifespan. <laughs> papers always would write about it. So, so the East King, quote, put on the spot, unquote, which means they assassinated, but they used those, they couched it in those terms. And um, one guy interested me particularly, his name was Morris Coran. Uh, Morris uh, had a hardware store downtown, which he sold parts to make steels. And um, he had a bad habit of telling the police and federal agents who was buying what. And there would be a raid. And Morris would show up after the raid and commiserate with the guy and said, geez, that's terrible. You're out of business. Hey, I got this stuff. I mean, I can get you some more of this if you want it. And then he'd go out and he'd tell the cops again. Well, that ended one day when he came out of his house with his 10-year-old daughter and a couple guys pulled up in a car and killed him dead. So last year I was speaking at the East Liberty Historical Society. And after I'm done, this guy walks up to me and he says, oh, Mr. Eric, I really enjoyed your story about Morris Coran. I go, oh, really? No, what's, you know, did, you, did you live in that area or did you read something about it? He goes, no. He says, that 10-year-old girl was my, my mom and that was my grandfather who was killed that day. And he pulls out this big screwdriver. Coran hardware. He says, I still have this. One of the things I kept from his business. Now, these guys, <laughs> they're characters. Uh, Joe the Ghost Pagnello was a big bootlegger. He was the only guy to die in bed of natural causes. I think he died of pneumonia. <laughs> now, we had Stefano Monastero, who was murdered, and he was succeeded by Luigi Big Gorilla Lamentola. 
I don't have to tell you what Big Luigi looked like. He was about this high and about this wide, and he dragged his knuckles on the floor. Uh, and then we had a Squirrel Hill dude. Giuseppe Siragusa lived here in Squirrel Hill. He lived in a paper set, a $50,000 mansion. And one morning, Mrs. Siragusa was uh, going uh, to Sunday Mass, and Joe's downstairs in his little private domain shaving, and he hears this noise, and he turns around, and there's three guys, and boom, 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 Joe's dead. The only witness to the crime is his parrot. And when the police got there, the parrot kept saying, poor Joe, poor Joe, poor Joe, poor Joe. <laughs> then there were two other guys, Joe, Jack Palmieri and Toto Amoroso. They were partners. They were both murdered within 18 hours of each other. Now, the story goes that supposedly Palmer was, uh, he was uh, like approached by some guys from New York City and said, we want to, you know, buy your yeast business. And he said no, and he knew that they were going to come after him. So he kept moving around every day, sleeping in different places. And somehow he made a mistake and he was walking up in the hill district and a guy walked up behind him and blew his brains out. Um, and then they found Toto 18 hours later in what is now Monroeville was called Patton Township at the time. He had been strangled and stabbed a few times. Um, that brings us to the Volpe brothers. Anybody originally from Turtle Creek? <laughs> Anything know about the Volpe? Well, you guys, you got some people back here, okay? There was eight Volpe brothers, and um, John Volpe was the oldest son, and he was the leader of this gang, and. He, uh, they were in the Turtle Creek area. They were big time mafia guys, very ruthless. They wanted to move into Pittsburgh, so they set up shop in the Rome Coffee Shop in the Hill District where the Civic Arena used to stand, and now it's PPG Paint Arena. And um, he had a bad habit of following the routine. Every Saturday, he would go to this barber shop and he would get a shave and his shoes shined. And then he would go from there up to the coffee shop to meet two of his brothers. Well, on one particular Saturday, he goes up, starts to walk in, and he sees his car pull up with three guys in it. One of them is his former bodyguard, Big Mike Spinelli. And he knows that he's not there for, you know, for a social call. He tries to make a dash for his armor-plated car. They blast them away, and they go inside, and they blow away his two brothers. Oh. In broad daylight, dozens of witnesses. And uh, that led to the downfall of the Volpe's. Well, his surviving brothers, you know, they were pretty angry. And they suspected that, that their asylum partner, John Bazzano, who owned the coffee shop, although in the building the coffee shop was in, had something to do with this. So they went to the New York Commission, and the Mafia Commission in New York, and they complained. So Bizzano, who was originally from New Kensington, but now he was, he's living in this mansion. He's the new yeast king up in Mount Lebanon. He gets a call from, from New York and says, hey, come on up. We're going to have a banquet in your honor. You're the new big goomba in, in Pittsburgh. Come on up. He comes up there with a guy named Joe Tito. You're laughing. You know the name? I, I know him, Tito. <laughs> well, you'll know this Tito. So... Tito gets called in and says, you know, you're, you're, police think you're a suspect. He said, I, I didn't have anything to do with this murder. So they said, get out of town. Bazzano goes to this so-called banquet. He's met by these thugs who immediately stab him about 61 times, mm -hmm. strangle him, cut his tongue out, and tape him up, stick him in a burlap bag, and throw him into the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. And um, so Bazzano is no more. No footnote to this Joe Tito. He was a big racketeer. Rolling Rock beer, anybody drink it? Litro Brewing, yeah. that's the guy that went, on, went clean and bought Litro Brewing Company that made Rolling Rock beer. Uh, whatever happened to Big Bike Spinelli that did the killing? Well, the father of the Volpe brothers was in the fruit business and he retired and he went back to his home village in Italy, which was the same village that Mike Spinelli lived in. And lo and behold, the old man sees Mike Spinelli. And says, there's a guy who killed my kids. So he gets arrested by the Italian police, the United States, moves to extradite. The government of Italy says, no, no, we don't. we're not going to send him back. We'll try him here. Supposedly, from the only documentation I could find, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. 
Whether or not he served it, I, I, can't, I can't tell you because I simply couldn't find any other documentation uh, as to what happened. But uh, a little another interesting footnote, John Bazzano's lawyer was Frank Zappala, <laughs> who's, I believe, his grandson is the DA in Allegheny County. Maybe not for long. Hopefully not for long. Not that I'm casting his versions. <laughs> now, um, so we're, we're going through this wild time. People are dying. Did you? Liquor is flooding the town. But the progressive era comes to Pittsburgh. It's an era of reform, more attention to social issues, things like that. And, you know, for the first time, more Americans are living in cities than in our own rural areas or on farms. Uh, women start drinking in public. Uh, start smoking. Headlines go up from below the knee. Men start greasing their hair and calling themselves sheiks after Rudolf Valentino, and the women are, they call, they give them a term called flappers. <laughs> Tabloid journalism comes into being because the reporters and the editors love these stories of these murders. I mean, I'm, I'm only giving you a Cliff Notes version of some of the stuff that's in the books because there's some other stuff that is really crazy. Um, but then something else happened. Damn women again. What happened? Come on, tell me. Women got the boat. Exactly. Farmers who initially supported prohibition wanted it repealed because they weren't selling grain. The women wanted it repealed because they were just sick of the violence. They were sick of their husbands coming home drunk. They were sick of having their husband's paycheck go down the drain, literally. So they started this campaign uh, to, to repeal the, 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 19th, the repeal the 18th Amendment, and they had it was a great marketing campaign. They had little cigarette cases that they passed out, repeal the amendment or repeal prohibition, scarves, and lipstick cases, and all these little gadgets and gimmicks to to, to try to sway uh, congressmen. And, and and it worked because these congressmen had to listen to these women. There was now a new voting block in the United States. And that uh, these guys figured, hey, we better listen to them. And you know, the the uh, fervor of the anti um, the, of the anti saloon league and the uh, women's Christian Temperance Union it kind of petered out. People weren't listening to them again. Hoover formed a thing called the Wickersham Commission to look into whether or not uh, this was uh, this is worthwhile to continue it to continue it uh, because. The enforcement of prohibition is really half-hearted most most of the places, and then F. Franklin Roosevelt, you know, he he campaigned on uh, repeal. Remember the old expression, "What this country needs is a good five-cent beer." Um, so eventually, all the states ratify, Utah being the last state. There's some old rummy in a bar downtown named Otto Sorbel. He wants to be the last guy to drink moonshine before prohibition is repealed. So this bar got this ticker tape in waiting for the vote from Utah. He's at the bar, you know, warming up, getting ready, and they pour him his drink, and they said, okay, or Otto, it's time. He drinks it, and he immediately spits it out. And he says, that's bonded booze. You ruined my record. He was all upset about that. Now, what he should have been upset about was, when repeal came, there was a shortage of liquor. And the bars and restaurants and nightclubs couldn't get enough of the bonded stuff immediately. So they start selling moonshine at, new, at higher prices, telling people, this is the good stuff, this is bonded liquor. And it wasn't, it was just, you know, around all the beer breweries in Pittsburgh, there was cars lined up for miles. Everybody could get two cases of beer that night, and they were all over Pittsburgh, Lawrenceville, uh, Northside, a lot of you know, downtown, and um, so they they got the they got that stuff. But it was so it was such a shortage because when when prohibition went into effect, a, a lady here gave me this thing. Uh, all the liquor distributors and wholesalers and bars and restaurants had six months to get rid of their stuff, their stocks. So she was showing me this Schmidt and Friday, this company, 
and they have listed all their stuff that's for sale: pure rye whiskey, champagne, wines, rum, gin, etc. And you had, and if you didn't get rid of it, then it was confiscated. It was put in bonded warehouses. Now there was a number of bonded warehouses in Fayette County, in Southern Westmoreland County, and um, bootleggers. I'm gonna tell you, these guys—they never quit thinking. It got to the point where they knew that you could go to a bonded warehouse and get. I think it was 13 cases of liquor without them checking with higher authorities to see if it was okay. So these guys forged these documents and they were getting this booze. Then when they finally caught on, the government finally caught on, they, they stopped it all together. So these guys simply got these big trucks, put a chain on the end, chained the door, pulled them out, ran in, stole as much as they could. Some bootleggers went to the point of renting a vacant office space and opening and stocking it like a pharmacy. And their only purpose was to sell booze. They weren't really a pharmacy. They weren't giving up drugs or anything. They were just, it was just a cover for booze. There was also these doctor's offices. There's a photograph in a book that says uh, male patients only. Guys could go in and you know, get a prescription because you could get a prescription for, for alcohol for certain purposes. And then there was, of course, religious exceptions. Does anybody ever watch the Ken Burns film, Prohibition? Remember, there was a, somebody was narrating and said, yeah, when this happened, when they, when they passed this uh, religious exception, you had all these uh, Rabbi Murphy, Rabbi O'Boyle, Rabbi O'Toole, <laughs> all getting these exceptions for, uh, for liquor. And you know what? It didn't stop. Prohibition didn't stop. Bootlegging. There was still bootlegging going on after Prohibition was repealed, uh, which I found surprising. And there was people still dying and fighting over the price of beer and the price of liquor. And you can go, there's parts of Pittsburgh today you can go to and find speakeasies because you don't have to pay a tax, you know, you can, no regulation, no government oversight. Unfortunately for Pennsylvania, the governor at the time was Gifford Pinchot, a very progressive man. But he was, he didn't want to see prohibition done away with. He had been to Europe as a student and was appalled by the German drinking habits. So he, he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to see that happen here. So he devised a plan to make it harder for Pennsylvanians to drink. Does anybody want to take a wild guess what that plan is? <laughs> exactly. I hate Gifford Pinchot. <laughs> and um, when, he, when he got it, uh, when he got it passed, I, this is what he told his congressman. I congratulate you upon an unprecedented achievement. You have adopted the best system of liquor control yet devised in America. I'm calling BS on that one. <laughs> uh, there was one other thing I just wanted to mention, if I can find it. There's a poem that pretty much sums up prohibition. Has anybody ever heard of third rail whiskey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's stuff that's not even aged, it's just like right out of the steel. It's wood terrible. Wood Almost like wood grain, yeah. People were drinking, uh, were drinking uh, antifreeze, dying. People drank uh, uh, grain alcohol and ended up going blind. Uh, chemists, uh, government chemists put something in uh, stuff to make people sick. But then the bootleggers chemists used the cosmetic chemistry technique to extract it, so it really wasn't uh, much of This poem pretty much sums up prohibition. Prohibition is an, awful is an awful flaw. We like it. It can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of graft and slime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. It don't prohibit worth a dime. We like it. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Sir, um, one name that nobody can confirm or deny about being involved with bootlegging is Art Rooney. 
from you where know, he got the money for the steel. Yeah, that's good. That's a, that's true. I think that's true. And I'll tell you why. Back in mid '90s, I had to go to uh, Washington when they opened up the Kennedy assassination files, the part where whether or not organized crime was involved in the in the death of the president. And I found an FBI debrief of Art Rooney, and he admitted that his his sometimes his connections to the mob scared him. He had a deal with the mafia that all the slots north of the Allegheny River were his, all the slots south were the mobs. He also owned, a, his dad owned a saloon and then he owned a saloon. And it got to the point where there was so much, so many speaks in the north side that he called a meeting and said, look, none of us are making any money. We're gonna to to have a schedule. So and so could be open this night. You'll be open this night, you know on down the line, so at least everybody's going to get a little bit of money out of this thing. But yeah, he had a connection to, and somebody told me that, uh, same with Davy Lawrence, and I don't know if this guy was telling me the truth, he said his his grandfather was close to the Lawrences and the Rooneys, and he said they were all fall down drunks. I don't know if that's true, but I know that Mrs. Lawrence was an alcoholic, and I don't know if David Lawrence drank, but this guy swears he did, and I know the Rooneys. Rudy's drank. I mean, all these people that are famous in Pittsburgh, if you go back, these public figures, if you go back a while, they all got some tarnish. Like the Zapalas and everybody. I mean, there's other people in this book you'll recognize the names. There's some tarnish there. So. Okay. It kind of sounds as if uh, that uh, the distribution uh, of liquor and all that was kind of disorganized. I mean, for instance, in Chicago, it was uh, uh, Al Capone. In New York, it was Doug Schultz. And, and they had the very well-known uh, uh, well, uh, liquor, uh, liquor lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. It was deserving. That's why you had all the fighting. That's why you had all these gang wars. That's why you had all these murders. Everybody was going for a piece of market share. And that's, that's why it was important. I mean, in Pittsburgh, you know, you started out with, uh, well, they had the Black Hand before they had the Mafia, but the Black Hand was into extortion. It wasn't into the bootlegging. Then you had a guy, Gregorio Conti, then you had Salvatore Calderon. He succeeded him, and then uh, and these other names that I mentioned. And Big Luigi Lamondola was a cast off from the, uh, Cap the Capone mob. He came to Pittsburgh. And he actually wasn't a bootlegger. He told his bootleggers, he said, I want a cut or you're dead. Yeah. And if you looked at Luigi, what he looked like, you would give him a cut. <laughs> you would give him a white birth. So yeah, there was a lot of disorganization. And the only guy that brought organization was Mayor Klein, <laughs> who ended up being convicted of malfeasance and almost went to jail. And then he resigned and then died shortly thereafter. Ma'am? Wasn't Shinley originally involved in making alcohol? Shinley. Shinley. Well, I don't know. You mean about, is that, that you talking about Mary Shenley? Well, no, no, it would have been an ancestor of hers. I actually have an ancient Shenley bottle. Of, of Shenley. Well, there was a Shenley distillery in Gilpin in Armstrong County. Yeah, oh, okay. that that was the big place. They they tried to ship two hundred thousand gallons a week out of there to avoid paying a state tax on it after mm -hmm. repeal. But that's the only Shenley that I'm aware of. Is that Latrell? No, it was Gilpin Township of Armstrong County. Somebody over there. You, you mentioned that, um, that there are still places today in Pittsburgh, you call them speakeasies, mm -hmm. where people can go and drink. Yeah. Are, you, are you, is that the same thing as an after-hours club? No, no, these okay. are like up in the Hill District, little joints. Okay, and you, do you still have to know a password to get in? Uh, <laughs> not in those places. In, there was a place, <laughs> one of the books I was reading about jazz, there was a place, the, what the hell was it called? up in Hill District said you need to go through five steel doors, know a password, which began with the letter D and ended with the letter R. <laughs> it was a dollar. And before you could get in. And the Manaka Club, which was really notorious, they had lights above the door. And if two lights were on, there was going to be a raid that night because they already knew. And if one light was on, it was good. There was a Paul, somebody was the Paul Revere of bootlegging in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah.
Joseph Kennedy, he was doing bootlegging. Oh, yeah, Joseph Kennedy. Well, you know, uh, mm -hmm. he had the whole franchise for uh, liquor in the United States. That's where their money came from. Weren't they bringing a lot of liquor in from Canada there? For them? They did. They I brought a lot of relatives that used to come from Canada and always have us for weddings. Through Lake Erie. A lot of them got smuggled in from Lake Erie. There's a story in one of the, I think, Western Pennsylvania History Magazine that talks about that. That was the Purple Gate. From Detroit, yeah. <laughs> Sir? Is, is moonshine a particular product or is it just a generic term for illegal alcohol? It's just a generic term. And if you ever, I, I was telling somebody before the speech that I lived in West Virginia for a while and I had a real stuff from the hollow. So. Varney Hall or whatever. What's, what's it taste like? You ever drink gasoline? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the stuff, uh, the moonshine is sold in liquor stores. I talked to one of the guys there. He says, this is just bottom shelf whiskey with coloring. It's not moonshine. <laughs> but I've had it. I've had the real stuff and it sucks big time. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Yeah, I'm puzzled at the amount of murders. You know, there were other, there were, there's other kinds of crime besides liquor before and after prohibition. Uh, why is, why would there be so much murder associated? And is it worse, was it worse in Pittsburgh? And if so, why was it worse in Pittsburgh? One of the things you have to remember that Pittsburgh wasn't the size today or then as it was, no, not the size today it was then. You know, we had a population of nearly just under 700,000 people. And you had a heavy ethnic population. And that created, you know, every time you get immigrants and you have a certain element of crime, gangs that come up. And I think that's one of the things that's, that, that happened here is that you had so many gangs, there was so much booze being made and smuggled in and, and shipped out that um, uh, and, and it was connections, big connections. Some of these guys were major players. Like, there was this club called, uh, I want to say it's either the Chuck Hammer, it's either Bachelor's Club or the Chelsea. Bachelor's Club. And it was a guy named Pittsburgh Jaime Martin. And, and Jaime Martin had killed a uh, Cleveland councilman, got convicted and sentenced to life, and then he won a retrial and all the witnesses disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> but he came back to Pittsburgh, and he ran that club, and then he later, you ever heard of the name Mo Dallitz? Remember the movie The Godfather, the guy's getting the massage, and he gets the shot in the eye? Well, that's based on Mo Dallitz, and Jaime Martin ended up working for Mo Dallitz, gambling operations all over the country. So there was guys that were connected like that, that you know, big-time stuff. The Volpes were big. The Volpes were very big until the murders, and then everybody started chipping away at their power. And uh, some of the Volpes, if you go back and read some of the Pennsylvania Crime Commission reports, you'll see that some of the remaining Volpe brothers, you know, ended up in trouble. And then you had the Manorinos up in the Ken area. Mm -hmm. So these are people that were all very high up. Manorinos, you know, they got caught up in Appalachia, New York, during the 57 raid, between all the meeting of the big mafia bosses. So yeah, they had some stature, and some of the people, <laughs> some of the people uh, that uh, the Rooney's ran around with the Genovese's, Genovese's. I was interviewing. I'm writing this book on jazz, and I'm interviewing this piano player. Said when he was a teenager, he played at the Genovese Cocktail Lounge. He says it was a kind of rough place, but he's, and I says rough. I says Frank, Michael Genovese owned it. You know who he was? He was the head of the mafia in Western Pennsylvania <laughs> until he died in the early '90s. I says, yeah, that's that's the kinds of connections you had in these places. So, sir, ma'am, you want? Go ahead. How did things change after prohibition was over? Well, there was still violence. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, people continued to make illegal booze to avoid paying state tax, and then there was some people. There was some shootings and killings of uh, beer distributors over the sale of the price set for a case of beer. Wow. Which surprised me. I mean, it seems like and then you know, I've been a hill district. There are still speakeasies today that are operating. Okay, the written exam will be short. <laughs> <laughs>
It's a little off topic, but uh, when I was a graduate student in New York a hundred years ago, but after Prohibition, uh, you could, uh, I was a chemistry graduate student, and you could get, oh, they would have loved you. In the <laughs> you could get lab ethanol that they didn't pay taxes on, but it had to be distributed by someone bonded in, in our storeroom. The two people who were bonded, one of them, was actually our local numbers runner. <laughs> and one time, he used to, at about 1 o'clock every afternoon, there was a public phone outside of my laboratory. And at 1 o'clock every day, he would start pacing uh, back and forth. And the, the phone would ring, and he would dive in, and you know, like this. And uh, one time, one time, he wasn't there. And of course, this is right by my laboratory. And uh, I decided, am I going to answer it or not? I'm going to answer it. So comes this voice right out of Damon Runyon. You couldn't believe it. Hello, Joe Dare. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, am I going to make some kind of wise ass remark? No. No, he isn't. Boom. <laughs> I wish I had you write writing this book because there's a section about the chemistry. There's a section about the chemistry of some of that stuff that I didn't quite understand, so I just kind of made it up as I went along. <laughs> Ma'am, my father told me there were four speakeasies downtown. Do you know where they were? One was uh, in the Fulton Building. No, I really don't. I mean, I, they were. The, the, the geography of Pittsburgh has changed so much, I, I couldn't even begin to guess uh, yeah. there's exactly. One, there's one in the William Patton that when you went to Open Doors Pittsburgh, you could go. Oh yeah, that's right, there was. And it's still there now. There's that, well, it's fancy now. It, yes. and, and there was a theater, too. Uh, maybe it was the Stanley in the backstage of the Stanley. There was a speakeasy there, too. I think I mentioned it in the book. I mentioned a lot of things in the book, but not all of them are true. I made a lot of that shit up. So. <laughs> I, ran, I had so many words, so I kind of like just padded. Oh, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. This whole thing about bonded warehouses, they existed throughout Prohibition. I'm, I didn't hear the last one. Did they exist throughout Prohibition? Yes, uh-huh. Who got the permission to take out legal liquor from them? Well, and when it was repealed, oh, okay. the I'll state, got, matter of fact, Governor Pinchot, you know, the state, this was during the Depression, the state was broke. So they took all this liquor and they sold it for $2 a quart and they called it sweepstakes whiskey or Pinchot whiskey. Huh. And uh, people, it was just flooded all over the city. We had another mayor, this guy wasn't corrupt, but he was a real jerk stein, William McNair. He hated, he was a Mennonite, he didn't drink, and he, he was he was really upset when Pinchot started peddling this stuff. And it was used to raise money for, for welfare programs to feed people. And he wanted to leave raids on, uh, on liquor stores and smash windows. And people, he was served as a police magistrate once while he was mayor, and like brought eight or nine guys in and were all arrested for drunk and disorderly, and he goes, what you guys drink? He says, uh, pinch of whiskey. He says, not guilty. <laughs> he ended up calling the governor to complain about it. So, in the 20s, my mother worked for a newspaper downtown, the Gazette Times, and it was one of those things where they, they finished working sort of late at night, mm -hmm. and they'd all go up to a speakeasy in the Hill District, and people uh, would be there, and famous uh, singers like Shally Alpin was there one time. Houdini was there, and they all drank something called Dago Red out of oh, yeah. coffee cups. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have it? No, it's good. It's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> it'll, send, it'll put you to ha ha. <laughs> A couple glasses of that stuff. So. Well, thank you again very much. Very much, Richard. I, I think everyone enjoyed that. So lots of smiles in the audience. Uh, and we have a tradition here at the end where people help carry their chairs over to, so they can be put in a rack. And again, thanks for coming today.